Good afternoon. I'm State Treasurer Colleen Davis, and here in my office, our job is to manage the state's finances responsibly. But it's not just important for the state to manage its finances as well. It's also important for all Delawareans to manage their personal finance as well, including and especially our state employees. That's how we achieve financial security and create a better future for all of us and for our families. Um, a critical part of improving your personal finances and gaining financial security is reducing debt. That's why last year we held a series of webinars to educate state employees about how to wipe out your student debt through public service loan forgiveness or what's called PSLF. Following those webinars, I was thrilled to see so many state employees reaching out to my office to tell us that, you know, thanks to those webinars, they finally figured out how to take advantage of the PSLF and get their student loan debt completely erased. So now in the fall of 2023, with so much changing in the world of student loans, we decided it was time to do more of these events so that we could make sure that state employees get the current and up-to-date information that you really need to get your student loans under control. Today, we'll discuss student loan forgiveness programs, especially PSLF. If you don't know much about PSLF, you'll learn how it works, how you can take advantage of it, and how extremely beneficial it is to borrowers who work in public service. And if you already know a lot about PSLF, you'll probably learn more today because a lot has actually changed with PSLF recently. You may be able to benefit tremendously from those changes. Of course, not all of you will be able to get your student loan forgiven, forgiven today. You might need uh, to continue to make payments on your loans for a while longer. That's why we scheduled another virtual event in a few weeks on November 15th, join us again to learn more about the strategies and tips for managing your student loans, choosing a payment plan, and keeping your payments affordable. As I myself struggled as a teen to see how I was going to finance my education, knowing my parents couldn't help, and as an adult with three children, I know the overwhelming fear that can arise when faced with insurmountable student debt. But I want to help alleviate that fear and help get you the knowledge that you need. We have an esteemed expert who also understands that fear. Heather Jarvis can truly give you the knowledge that you need and empower you to jump into action and to put that knowledge to use. So I hope you all learn a ton of valuable information today that will make you a real uh, will make a real difference in your financial well-being. But first, I have to give big thank yous. A huge thank you to Governor Carney for supporting this event. Thank you to the Government Information Center, GIC, for producing this amazing live stream and working hard to help us prepare this event. And a very big thank you to Secretary Claire DeMattius and the State of Delaware Department of Human Resources for partnering with us with us on this event um, and making this possible. We could not have gotten it done without them. Um, so thank you so, so much. And I also wanted to lend my gratitude to Ashley Block of DHR. Ashley is actually gonna step in um, and, uh, and, and take it away in a moment, but I do wanna give one last uh, couple of thank yous. One is to Matt Rosen, who's really and truly worked hard from my team uh, in the Office of State Treasurer uh, really done a phenomenal job of helping to put this together. And again, I want to thank Heather Jarvis for being with us today and again, lending her incredible knowledge. Um, so Ashley, again, thank you and please take it away. Thank you. Um, sorry, guys. Um, I'm Ashley from the Department of Human Resources. I'm getting over cold, so if I sound uh, a little gruff, apologies. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to share a few words um, on behalf of the Department of Human Resources and Secretary Claire DeMattias, who regrettably couldn't join us today. Um, but I'm thrilled. I, I heard we had 1,200 people registered for this, so I'm excited to see the interest is there. Um, 
and I'm a student loan holder myself, so I understand the significance of these programs and we're happy to partner with the Office of the Treasurer to share today's webinar. Um, we know that this is a remarkable benefit for public servants, but at the same time, we know that everybody's not well informed. And um, we hope that this webinar will be informative and a valuable resource for everyone. And um, we also know this is a great re recruitment tool from the DHR perspective. Um, but that's all that I have to say. And then I hope that you guys um, learned a lot and that it demystifies the program a bit. I know there's been a lot of changes um, as um, Twitter Colleen uh, mentioned. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing some of this myself and I'll turn it over to you, Matt. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ashley. Um, so welcome everyone. And before I introduce uh, Heather, our presenter, I just wanted to share some quick information. Uh, first, if you haven't yet done so, please sign up at de.gov slash student loans. Many of you have done that already. That might be how you got the link to this live stream. But if you haven't signed up at de.gov student loans yet, I recommend uh, doing that. Um, that way we can send you updates. Um, we can send you the slides uh, from today. Uh, if there's new information about student loans that you might want to know, we can share it with you or other helpful resources or other future events about student loans. We can let you know if you sign up uh, on de.gov slash student loans. Um, and also there's some resources that you can look at right now. Um, again, if you visit de.gov slash student loans and scroll all the way down, you'll see a list of links to information and resources about the topics we'll be discussing today. Uh, for example, Heather's gonna talk about PSLF, Public Service Loan Forgiveness today. And on that page, uh, you'll see where you can go to certify your, your employment for PSLF, where you can find more information about PSLF and many other things about uh, PSLF. Uh, so, uh, and other student loan topics that we'll be discussing. Um, and as Treasurer Davis mentioned, um, we have another live stream about student loans on November 15th at 12 p.m. So if you wanna get the live stream link for that event, you can get it by signing up at de.gov slash student loans. Um, and finally, I wanna let you all know that you can ask questions during this presentation. Um, on YouTube, you should see the live chat on the right side of your screen. You can also pop it out. Um, or on mobile, the live chat may be below the video. So as Heather presents this information to you, if you're still unsure or confused about anything, or if you need additional information, please go ahead and enter your questions into the live chat. Uh, we've got a lot of people today, so uh, we can't promise that your question will get answered, but Heather will try to answer as many as she can. Um, so um, without further ado, let me introduce our presenter for today. Heather Jarvis is widely known for her depth of knowledge and accessible teaching style. She has provided student loan education and consultation for universities, associations, and professional advisors since 2005. Heather graduated cum laude from Duke University School of Law in 1998 and dedicates her professional efforts to advocating on behalf of high debt student loan borrowers. Heather con contributes to student debt relief policy for the House Education Committee and others in Congress and recently completed service on the American Bar Association Task Force on Financial Legal Education. So thank you for being here today, Heather, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Matt, and uh, thank you, Treasurer Davis. Thank you, Ashley. I really appreciate the leadership in bringing this information to you, and I'm delighted to talk to you about all different kinds of student loan forgiveness today. We'll focus especially on public service loan forgiveness and also on income-driven repayment forgiveness. Um, but we'll talk, we'll touch on a lot of different kinds of forgiveness provisions today. Um, so with that, we'll take the next slide, please. Um, public service loan forgiveness takes at least 10 years to earn, and it's measured by the making of 120 qualifying payments. And I encourage you to, to really latch on to the terminology for today's presentation. So we, we are very carefully saying at this point, 
qualifying payments. And you see, I have a little asterisk there by payments because sometimes a payment is not a payment. And sometimes you can get credit for a qualifying payment for making something called the equivalent of a payment, which isn't actually you sending any money. But I want you to know that your goal, if public service loan forgiveness is what you seek, is to see the count towards forgiveness approaching 120, because 120 months or qualifying payments is how public service loan forgiveness is earned. And after achieving the 120 qualifying payments, then whatever balance is remaining on eligible loans is canceled and forgiven in its entirety. And that forgiveness is exempt from taxation under the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so next slide, please. There are lots of different sorts of paths towards loan forgiveness. Unfortunately, few of them apply to private student loans. So first, uh, reflect on whether you have federal or private loans or both. Um, many of us were able to finance education with mostly or exclusively federal student loans, um, but the federal borrowing limits for undergraduates are rather low. So sometimes students borrow private student loans for undergraduate school, and often parents chip in um, when they are able to, in part by borrowing federal student loans called parent plus loans. So I want to point out that parent plus loans are eligible for the primary forgivenesses we're talking about today income-driven repayment forgiveness, as well as public service loan forgiveness. So we'll be talking about something called the account adjustment, which is going to really help plus up our progress towards forgiveness, um, because it certainly is the case that these programs have been difficult for us to navigate. They have been um, rather complicated in nature, and so um, people haven't always seen the progress that they anticipated or or expected to see. Um, but let me also just mention, um, you may have um, heard earlier this summer, the United States Supreme Court uh, issued a ruling that struck down President Biden's plan for a across the board debt cancellation in the amount of $10,000 for uh, families and students earning less than $125,000 a year. Um, some borrowers were to be eligible for 20000 if they had received Pell Grants. So this was President Biden's debt cancellation plan. The United States Supreme Court this summer ruled that the administration, in their view, lacked the authority for this loan cancellation idea. Um, however, immediately after the United States Supreme Court ruling, the administration filed a notice of negotiated rulemaking, which is just a way of starting a regulatory process in order to um, achieve policy goals um, in alternative um, fashions. So those hearings have already begun. And there is still a um, path towards debt cancellation. Um, the administration is presently developing the, um, the policy proposals that may come to fruition. Um, it is necessarily true, however, that this negotiated rulemaking process takes longer than it would have taken for the um, Secretary of the Department of Education to simply apply the president's policy. So stand by for more information on that. Um, the Office of the, um, of the Treasury will certainly make you aware of it um, when something happens, but we're, we're, um, we're standing by for that. So that's one thing. We'll also speak briefly at the end of today's presentation about some discharge provisions for student loans that are tied to specific professions. And those tend to be typically for folks in teaching professions or healthcare professions, although there are some um, others as well. We'll talk about that. And we'll talk about some discharge provisions or forgiveness provisions that are part of the Higher Education Act and that are available for people who have um, 
had problems with their school. So we'll talk about those discharge provisions in today's presentation. Um, the primary focus of most of our time will be on both income-driven repayment forgiveness or IDR forgiveness, as well as public service loan forgiveness, and the way that this very important um, procedure called the account adjustment is going to impact our progress towards forgiveness. So the account adjustment means that the rules regarding forgiveness are as generous and flexible as they ever have been. Um, however, that means that things are even a little bit more confusing than usual because there it is the case that you may well have heard certain rules in the past that are not exactly the way things are presently being applied. And similarly, the way things are presently being applied is not exactly how things are going to be applied in the future. So I've got various sets of rules that I want to explain to you today so that you can take the actions that will result in the best results for you. Um, so my goal for you really today is for you to be able to evaluate your own circumstances, determine what actions you need to take, um, and have the um, confidence you need in order to carry out whatever is best for you. And that's different for, for all of us. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So there are two primary paths to loan forgiveness within the federal student loan system. And one of them is not tied to your employment at all. So it's not based on your public service or whether you work or what kind of work you do, um, but is, is instead tied to your selection of a certain kind of repayment plan called an income-driven repayment plan. And when I say income-driven repayment or IDR, that is meant to be an umbrella term that encompasses several different specific repayment plans that fall under that umbrella. So examples of IDR plans include the president's new plan called SAVE or Saving on a Valuable Education, which is the most affordable for most of us, as well as other plans that you may be already enrolled in, including pay as you earn, uh, income-based repayment, and specifically income contingent repayment which is especially important for parent borrowers to be aware of. So recall I mentioned parent plus loans and parent plus loans are eligible for income driven repayment forgiveness or IDR forgiveness. They're also eligible for PSLF. However, parent loans aren't eligible for most of the best IDR plans. For example, you can't choose the SAVE plan, you can't choose various other things for parent loans. You have to first consolidate a parent plus loan into a direct consolidation loan. And that consolidation loan is then eligible for one and only one of the income driven plans. And that's the plan called income contingent repayment. And under ICR or income contingent repayment, the length of time until loan cancellation is a maximum of 25 years. So under all of these income driven plans, if a, if a student loan borrower is at any point enrolled in an IDR plan, then their loan balance will be canceled and forgiven if, if a balance still exists after this long term of repayment. And usually it's 20 years for people who only have undergraduate loans who did not borrow federal loans for graduate or professional school. And usually it's 25 years for people who did borrow for graduate and professional school. Um, also 25 years for those parent borrowers in the ICR plan. Um, but the IDR plans have this maximum period of forgiveness. And what is happening right now is something called the account adjustment. And the account adjustment is a way of correcting past problems within the student loan system. So these IDR plans have been available for a long time, but student loan borrowers have struggled to see their progress towards forgiveness. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but the, the Biden administration has 
taken it upon themselves to review our loan histories in order to correct errors that occurred in the past. Um, and so I want you to consider how this account review under the thing I'm calling the account adjustment to see what you need to do to benefit. And many of us don't need to do anything because the review is automatic, but some folks will benefit from consolidating certain kinds of student loans, and we'll be looking at that in some detail. So I would also like to mention that um, the Income Driven Repayment Forgiveness or IDR forgiveness, um, again, the, the forgiveness that is not tied to your employment, but that is based instead on your selection of a repayment plan, that forgiveness might end up being taxable to you if you achieve that forgiveness after the calendar year 2025. Right now, all student loan forgiveness is exempt from taxation, but the provision of the Internal Revenue Code that exempts this particular forgiveness from taxation is scheduled to sunset at the end of 2025, um, meaning there's a chance that you would have to pay tax on the amount that was forgiven as if you had earned it in the year in which you received it. Now, that's... Um, the sunsetting or expiration of this tax treatment for IDR forgiveness does not apply in the same way to PSLF. So PSLF is going to be tax-free under a permanent provision of the tax code, the Internal Revenue Code, and so it's not subject to that same concern or possibility of taxation. Um, but to be clear, it's better to get your loans forgiven and then have a tax um, consequence than it is to not get your loans forgiven. It costs less to pay a fraction of your total indebtedness to the Internal Revenue Service than it does to pay 100% of the indebtedness to the Department of Education. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so the reason for the IDR account adjustment is that people weren't getting all the information they needed. There were folks who should have consolidated, but loan servicers were not able to give them that advice in a timely manner. There were people who spent multiple months and years in forbearance statuses, and that may be some of us on the call today. Um, people were not um, informed about income-driven repayment when they should have been, um, and maybe weren't um, given appropriate or timely advice on filing forms documenting their public service in the case of public service loan forgiveness. And so for these reasons, people have seen um, very little forgiveness in past years, and there has been a, a, an understanding um, skepticism on the part of the student loan borrowers. Um, and next slide, please. And so, hence the IDR account adjustment. And under the account adjustment, we will see our accounts in, um, increase their project, their progress towards forgiveness because the Department of Education is changing certain past periods, certain past months or past payments, and they are changing them from ineligible to eligible. And so something called an eligible payment or equivalent is being counted by the IDR account adjustment. And so you may have been told in the past that month didn't count towards forgiveness or that year in forbearance didn't count towards forgiveness, but under the adjustment, it will. And the account adjustment is being applied automatically to all the months that we had in a so-called repayment status, which essentially means not in an in-school deferment, not in the first six months after you graduate, which is a grace period, um, but any time after you had enrolled in a repayment plan, no matter which plan it was, and no matter how much the payments were, or whether you made them on time or in multiple um, installments. And so this is true without regard for your loan type or your payment plan. And this is, yes, new, different, not the way it's been in the past, not the way it'll be in the future, but this is happening now. And so we want to make sure that we benefit the way that it, it is intended for us to benefit. And so if you have 
um, 12 or more consecutive months of forbearance on your loan history or 36 cumulative months, then those periods can count towards both IDR forgiveness as well as PSLF. Um, if you take the right actions, and I'm going to tell you exactly what that is. Some deferments will also count, most will not. Um, but, but importantly, time that you have progressed towards forgiveness on loans that were later consolidated will be preserved um, under the IDR adjustment. So we'll talk about that a little bit more here as we go forward. Um, but remember when I talked about qualifying payments for PSLF and the importance of that terminology. And the reason that it's important to know that a qualifying payment for PSLF is an eligible payment or equivalent that has been matched with months that you've been working. Um, and so what you, what you need to know is that everything that counts for the IDR account adjustment can also count for PSLF, as long as you document your employment by filing the PSLF form. So all the periods counted under the IDR account adjustment can count towards both IDR forgiveness and PSLF. Um, and that is um, very exciting news. But there are some of us, hopefully not too many anymore, who have older student loans that would have to be consolidated in order to benefit from the adjustment. And I'll tell you how to figure out whether that's you. Um, there are other people who might benefit from consolidating even if it's not required. So I'm going to help you figure out if that's you. Um, and I'll take the next slide. Thank you. So for public service loan forgiveness um, going forward and also backward, to be honest, qualifying employment is quite broad. It's all full-time paid work for a government employer, state, local, federal, tribal government, um, agencies and entities. Uh, and it's also um, work for nonprofits that are structured as 501c3 organizations, plus a few other um, non-governmental public services, as long as they're performed in a non-profit setting. Um, and this is a little bit of a new scheme in terms of the way that this is defined. Um, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> So it, important to know that there is a deadline that is significant and that is New Year's Eve. So on December 31st, 2023, that's the last day you have to file a consolidation application for your federal student loans. And you should consider whether it makes sense for you to do so. And it, it does if you have certain kinds of older student loans, which we'll show you how to figure out. It makes sense for some parent plus loan borrowers because parent plus loans would have to be consolidated in order to benefit from the um, IDR adjustment. And they could also be considered for public service loan forgiveness once consolidated into a direct consolidation loan. Um, and also of um, importance, is that if you have a bunch of different loans that have already progressed towards forgiveness, but they don't all have the same count, then if you consolidate those together before the deadline, um, you will see the consolidation loan will be credited with the maximum number of qualifying payments towards forgiveness that was present on any of the underlying loans. So if you have some loans with more credit, other loans with less credit, you can benefit a lot by consolidating them together because then the whole consolidation loan has the maximum credit towards forgiveness. And this is only going to be true for a limited time. The Department of Education has said that they are um, applying this account adjustment um, up through 2024. It's not clear that it will take the entire year of 2024. It may be that it's concluded around the summer, um, but once it's complete, um, it, is, uh, it is not expected to be applied again. So these are the sorts of things that you wanna figure out now. 
Um, next slide, please. Um, so we'll move through this part really quickly, and this is for people who may have older student loans. So what, what you do to determine if you have these sorts of loans, log in at studentaid.gov and you'll see your dashboard. You want to click first to view details. Um, next slide, please. And then you'll have to click to view breakdown. Next slide. Once you see a list of the breakdown, click to view loan details for each loan that has a balance. If the balance is zero, you can skip it. Next slide. And then finally, you'll see something called loan type. So look for your loan type. The types of loans that are eligible for forgiveness, both IDR forgiveness and PSLF, are direct loans, direct loans only. So all direct loans are federal loans, but not all federal loans are direct loans. So look to see what loan type you have. And if it says FEL or FELP, that stands for Federal Family Education Loan Program, you can make that loan eligible by consolidating it. And I will tell you, we have told people for years that these fell loans are not eligible for forgiveness. And that was true, um, but it is not true for a limited time. So if you've got one of these loans, now's the time to consolidate it so that you can be credited for the history on these older loans. And it will be preserved and carried through in the consolidation. Next slide, please. So again, the deadline for taking that action is December 31st, 2023. You don't have to have the consolidation processed or completed before then. You just have to file the application by that date. Next slide. So at the beginning, I told you public service loan forgiveness, all about making 120 so-called qualifying payments. And for a payment to be considered qualifying, it is going to be recorded by the loan servicer when something called an eligible payment is matched to a month of full-time employment with a qualifying employer. And that's why it is very important that you file these PSLF forms that serve to certify your employment. Because otherwise the student loan system doesn't know that you're in public service work. And you want every month that you have been working in public service to be matched up with months of eligible payments or equivalents. And those are those periods we mentioned where the loan is in a repayment status, whether a payment is made or not, whether the loan is in forbearance for 12 consecutive or 36 cumulative months, as well as periods where you might have been enrolled in a repayment plan, whether it was an income-driven repayment plan or not. So this is only temporarily um, the case. Uh, next slide, please. So for public service loan forgiveness, you do have to be employed in public service. No surprise there. You can either be a direct employee receiving a W-2 from a government or nonprofit employer, or newly um, the case, you, certain um, contractors who receive 1099s may be able to benefit. This is um, new and had not been the case previously. However, this new rule with regard to employment eligibility will be applied retroactively. So if you were uh, meeting these requirements um, any time after the beginning of PSLF, which was October 1st, 2007, then your employers are permitted to certify employment under these circumstances. Um, next slide, please. So the definition of full-time has been somewhat simplified in the new regulations, and the simplified definition is being applied again retroactively. So the definition of full-time is 30 hours a week, um, and you just have to average 30 hours a week over the period being certified. And so depending on what, what period you're certifying, whether it's a year or 
three months or 10 years all at once, you have to average 30 hours a week. The definition used to be more complicated than that. Um, for um, folks working on contract um, eight months in a 12 month period, for example, on an academic calendar, um, can be certified for 12 months out of the year, as long as they are working at least eight months. So you don't have to only be credited for the months of the academic calendar. You can be credited towards forgiveness for the full 12 months. Um, and the new um, the new rules also have a um, specific formula for calculating hours for um, non tenure track faculty me members in university settings. Um, and they're going to multiply their contact hours by at least 3.35. This is the instruction to the employer in order to arrive at the um, appropriate count of hours. So next slide, please. There are some jobs that don't count for PSLF, even though they might sound kind of public interest-y. Um, and for now, this is all businesses organized for profit, although we have been instructed that there will be a, another rule issued at some point by the, by the Department of Education regarding um, for-profit employment, particularly in the um, field of early childhood education. Um, but as the rules stand today, there is no qualifying employment that is structured as a for-profit entity. Um, similarly, non-qualifying is work for labor unions, partisan political organizations, um, and members of the United States Congress are in fact not eligible for PSLF. Uh, next slide, please. So, so what you want to do going forward for PSLF as opposed to the way that the adjustment will work on our accounts. So the account adjustment is going to count payments and months that otherwise wouldn't have counted. But after the adjustment, if you haven't already reached 120 payments and you're working towards PSLF, you, it's important to know that there are some repayment plans that don't qualify. Um, specifically, the standard repayment plan for a consolidation loan is um, possibly longer than 10 years. And any term of repayment that's longer than 10 years is not going to count towards PSLF. So be careful about that. Also be careful that graduated and extended repayment plans are not eligible plans for PSLF. So although you can get credit for the past months that you were employed um, making payments under the wrong plan, um, going forward after the adjustment, you'll need to enroll in an income-driven repayment plan in order to progress towards either IDR forgiveness or PSLF. Um, and also, um, teachers are not permitted to use the same period of service, both for their teacher loan forgiveness if they choose to apply for it, and for PSLF. So it is important to think about PSLF first because it has the potential to be a lot more generous than teacher loan forgiveness does. Next slide, please. So what you want to do is get your eligible payments or equivalents um, matched to your employment. So um, reflect on your own employment history and determine which months since October 1st, 2007 that you have wor been working an average of 30 hours or more per week. Um, and then use the PSLF help tool, um, which is at studentaid.gov backslash PSLF. Um, use that tool to prepare the form you need in order to file to certify your employment. <clears throat> and if you need to prepare more than one form, prepare more than one form. Um, but get these forms filed as soon as you can so that when the adjustment is applied to your account, they'll be matching up those eligible months, payments or equivalents together with your employment in order to make them qualifying, qualifying payments for the 120. Next slide, please. 
So the PSLF form that I've talked about certifying your employment on looks like this, but it should be prepared using the help tool. Um, next slide, please. And the help tool is going to take you through a process of populating the form and will allow you to submit it electronically. So there's going to be two things that you want to have when you go to this tool. Um, next slide. The first thing is the federal employer ID number for every job you've had in public service since October 1st, 2007, when the program took effect. So you can get that FEIN from the W-2, um, and you're going to click the little plus symbol to add an employer, and you can add as many employers as you have had. Next slide, please. So box B of your W-2 is where you find that federal employer ID number. There are a lot of different numbers on there and there's a state ID number, but it's not the state ID number. It's the federal employer ID number that you need um, because this is a federal program um, and they are looking for that. Uh, next slide, please. So if you also have the email address of someone who is authorized to sign to certify your employment, this would be, for example, a human resources professional or um, a direct supervisor, for example, then you can put their email address in and they will get an, a request from the Department of Education asking that they electronically sign your form, which will then trigger it to be submitted. And if you are not already assigned to the, the PSLF loan servicer, whose name is MOHILA, that's an acronym, Missouri Higher Education Loan Authority. If you're not already assigned to MOHILA, you will be transferred to MOHILA based on your filing of this form. Um, and because MOHILA is the servicer assigned to PSLF. Uh, next slide, please. And so after the account adjustment, which again is taking place now and into 2024, but after the account adjustment has given us credit for payments we wouldn't otherwise have gotten credit for, or credit for months in which we didn't even make a payment, right? Because it doesn't have to actually be a payment. It has to be an eligible payment or equivalent in order to become qualifying for forgiveness. So after the IDR account adjustment is applied, then you will need to be enrolled in a qualifying repayment plan in order to continue progressing towards forgiveness if you haven't already gotten across that finish line. And so enroll in an income-driven plan, which includes the new plan called SAVE. It also includes pay as you earn, IBR, and ICR. Um, Technically, you can make payments under a standard 10-year plan, um, but if you made 120 of those, you would pay off the debt yourself in its entirety. Um, it can include the amount you would have paid under a standard 10-year plan, um, but there are some repayment plans that are not eligible for um, forgiveness, and that will include something called the alternative repayment plan. And you should be aware that under one of the new IDR plans, under the SAVE plan, if you don't recertify your income when requested, you will be placed into an alternative repayment plan, which could trip some folks up in their progress towards forgiveness. So I wanna highlight that for your attention and for you to be cautious. Um, you do either have to pay the full amount due in one payment or you can now make it in multiple installments over the course of the period of time um, over the month in which it is scheduled. So next slide, please. Um, so determine if you need to consolidate your older loans, verify whether you, whether you have all direct loans, consider consolidating loans that are not already eligible. These would be loans that are not direct loans. Um, also give some consideration to whether you might benefit from consolidating direct loans together in order to um, plus up the payment count to the maximum on any of the underlying loans. And Parent PLUS borrowers should be considering um, whether they can benefit from these actions as well. 
However, be aware that if you have not gotten all the way to forgiveness, you will have to keep making payments that count towards forgiveness in order to actually achieve it. And for parent borrowers, the only available repayment plan that can progress you towards forgiveness is income contingent repayment, and it is the most expensive of the income-driven plans. So it can be cost prohibitive for some parents. Advocates like me are going to continue to work to, to make things more affordable for parents, um, but they're not always uh, eligible for every, every one of the best goodies. Um, so next slide. Um, just want to point out this Mohila payment tracker. Once you your loans are at Mohila and you have filed a PSLF form, you will be able to view your qualifying payments. You will even see where it's broken down eligible payments into qualifying versus not qualifying, and there will be payments potentially listed there that showing which need employment certification. Um, because again, an eligible payment becomes a qualifying payment when it is matched with a month of employment. Next slide. There is now going to be a formalized reconsideration process for public service loan forgiveness. If you have had public service forms denied, if you have had months of employment denied or an application for forgiveness denied, you have until the end of this calendar year to request reconsideration. Um, beginning, um, uh, beginning immediately, folks who are receiving the such denials will have a 90-day window only in which to request reconsideration and only a, and after that must supply new information um, in order to have any additional consideration. Um, all right, so last couple things I wanted to say before we're going to devote our um, attention directly to your questions. Um, next slide, please is that there are several profession specific discharges within the Higher Education Act. There is something called Perkins cancellation that is only for Perkins loans. Perkins loans are um, rather le uh, less common than they used to be, but some folks who've been around a while uh, might still have some Perkins loans. So you should be aware that they can be canceled based on certain um, actions like teaching. Um, but they can also be consolidated to be eligible for PSLF. And if they are consolidated, they are no longer eligible for Perkins cancellation. Um, but public service loan forgiveness is by far more generous than these other repayment plans. Uh, next slide, please. Teacher loan forgiveness is instead of PSLF. So you cannot get credit for the same period of time for teacher loan forgiveness that you get for PSLF, but you can earn up to $17,500 of forgiveness for certain kinds of loans based on certain kinds of service. Um, but again, it takes five years to get some, some um, narrow teacher forgiveness, whereas it it would take 10 years to get a more comprehensive PSLF, and you can't get credit for both for the same period of service. So do give teacher loan forgiveness some consideration, but also bear in mind that it is more narrow, it is more limited, and it may not be as beneficial for you as PSLF. So consider PSLF first. Um, next and last slide, please. Um, so I hope that none of you have had um, difficulty with the colleges or universities that you attended um, or the institutes that you attended. However, it is the case that there are a number of um, school systems that are that have um, closed while students were enrolled or who have um, unfortunately defrauded students um, and student loan borrowers. And so there are several statutory discharge provisions that are related to problems borrowers may have had with their schools. Um, one is closed school discharge if your school closed before you were able to complete your program of education. There are brand new rules regarding borrower defense to repayment, which is a way for student loan borrowers to um, 
uh, to avoid liability for some debt when their um, when their schools had um, committed to, uh, various malfeasances. Um, so also false certification of eligibility comes up occasionally where schools say that you are qualified to attend, but in fact may not be. Um, and uh, schools that do not pay you your student loan money, which is typically dispersed to schools, um, you can you can get some of that canceled as well under specific cir circumstances. And the Department of Education has the authority to compromise and settle student loans under certain statutory provisions related to discharge. Um, and I will ask my friend Matt Rosen from Treasurer Colleen Davis's office to please let me know what questions we have in the chat. And wait, if you don't mind, we don't need the slides anymore. Thank you. <laughs> I will happily ask some questions. Um, one thing I'm seeing a lot is, is this just applicable to federal loans? What if you have private loans? If you have private loans, can you convert them back to federal? Unfortunately. Loans that are truly private student loans that were issued by a bank or a private lender are much more like regular kinds of consumer debt than they are like federal student loans, and they are not eligible for any of the federal relief provisions, um, primarily because the federal government simply cannot forgive loans that are not owed to the federal government. Um, unfortunately, there is no mechanism to refinance or reconsolidate private student loans into the federal system. We've seen various proposals for that in Congress over the years. I, for one, think it's a good policy idea to allow borrowers, especially who had eligibility for federal loans, but who may have been steered into private debt instead, to convert that private debt into federal debt, but there is no existing mechanism for that. Um, there are a few loan repayment assistance programs for certain kinds of, um, of professionals that may be eligible to help you make payments on your private loans. Um, and be sure you're not, you're not conflating um, commercially held federal loans with private loans. So it's a, it's not infrequently that I see student loan borrowers believe that some of their federal loans that are held by private banks are in fact private loans, but they may be federal. So the best way to know for sure is log in at studentaid.gov where you can see a full comprehensive list of your federal loans. Um, but unfortunately, no, I don't have um, a lot of uh, good options for private student loans. Another question is, uh, my loans aren't with Mohila, they're with some other service, or does that mean I'm not eligible for PSLF? So if you're not with Mohila, it doesn't mean you're not eligible for PSLF, but it usually, though not always, means that you have not filed a PSLF form because that is the um, trigger to have your loans transferred to Mohila. Um, although Mohila has relatively recently taken that role over from a previous servicer known as FedLoan. Um, so no, you don't have to have Mohila, but you will get Mohila eventually. And, as, and I just wanted to make you aware that if you file that PSLF form, which you should, if you've been in public service, your loans will be transferred to Mohila. And that's what you want and need, because then you'll be able to see your progress towards, for, towards PSLF on their website. I think you may have covered this other thing, um, but people have keep asking about it. So it might be worth clarifying. Are Parent Plus loans eligible for PSLF? And they I do are forgiven. Yeah, so Parent Plus loans are eligible for both. They're eligible for PSLF based on the service of the parent. So to be clear, a Parent Plus loan is borrowed by the parent on behalf of a dependent undergraduate student. So it is not the student's public service that will achieve the forgiveness. It's the parent borrower's public service that could achieve the forgiveness. And some of us have parent loans 
um, that we borrowed for our children and also our own student loans. Um, and under this uh, account adjustment, now is a time when you might be able to increase your progress towards forgiveness on both sets of loans by combining them together. Um, so yes, PSLF eligible for both public service loan forgiveness and IDR forgiveness, but bear in mind that um, parent loans would have to first be consolidated because you can't choose an, an IDR plan for a parent plus loan without first consolidating it. And then you're only permitted to choose ICR. So bear in mind the payments under ICR are, are quite high for many of us. And so what I would encourage you to do is before you make any decision about consolidating or whether forgiveness will assist you as a parent borrower, determine what your payment amount would be under ICR based on your income. And you can do that using the um, loan repayment simulator. And I know that there is a link to it on um, the treasurer's uh, student loan page. So, I know you covered this um, and you just touched on it again, but people still are asking questions about it. Um, does it make sense to consolidate if you don't have a FELL loan? Um, and uh, somebody specifically mentioned if they're different lengths of time. I know you covered that, but we got some questions. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> the general rule is that if you have all direct loans, it's not required that you consolidate in order to benefit from forgiveness. However, you might benefit from consolidating direct loans together now because of the features of the IDR account adjustment that applies as well to PSLF. And the reason for that is because if you have you had or have um, and they will look at they will do the adjustment in order to increase the progress towards forgiveness and whatever is the highest number they can get on any of your underlying loans that's the number that would be attributed to a consolidation loan so and i do i know matt i you and i have both experienced it's very um nerve-wracking for student loan borrowers because we have been told in the past that consolidation could reset the clock towards forgiveness or make us lose time towards forgiveness and there are in fact still some of those warnings in a few places on the websites um i encourage you to look at the idr account adjustment faq page where you and you can specifically search for the term consolidation. I usually do that control F, put in consolidation, and it says things like, what will happen if I consolidate loans with this number of payments and that number of payments? Um, because now's the time to figure it out and take action um, because consolidating can help more of us um, than in typical uh, moments of history. So we're running low on time, but there's two questions I really want to squeeze in and I'll ask them both at once, which is, can you quickly recap the tax implications um, of loan forgiveness and where can I get more help with all this if I need someone to guide me through it? Okay, great. So um, public service loan forgiveness, not taxable as income. Most of those other forgivenesses we talked about, the different provisions are presently untaxable, not taxed as income. Income-driven forgiveness, the long-term one, assuming you do not get cancellation based on your public service, has the potential to be taxable as forgiveness to you, but nobody can tell you for sure whether it will be. If your loans are, are forgiven before the end of the calendar year 2025, there is a provision in place that will exempt that from forgiveness from taxation, so you will not have to pay tax on it. However, that provision is going to expire at the end of 2025 unless co Congress further extends it. Um, and I intend to ask Congress to further extend it and encourage you to do so as well. Um, it's easier to get Congress to re-up something they've already done than to get them to do something new in my experience. Um, however, if you, have, if you think you're gonna get forgiveness 10, 15 years down the line, yes, it's possible that it will be taxed as income to you in the year in which you receive it. The IRS does actually enter repayment plans with taxpayers. Um, so, you know, but ideally you would not be caught un unaware. 
in real oh, where quick. to go for more yeah. help. Right. So there is a um, collection of resources on the state treasurer's web, web page. You can read and look at those. Um, your loan servicer is a uh, source of information. The studentaid.gov site is great. I like the National Consumer Law Center's website, studentloanborrowerassistance.org, especially if you're facing default or other um, financial challenges. Um, be cautious um, otherwise. There are people who try to take advantage of and defraud student loan borrowers. There are things called, you know, debt relief for debt consolidation companies that will try to charge you money. You don't have to pay anyone to consolidate your loans. You can do it yourself. So you should be careful. Um, you can, of course, try to vet and look at um, advisors, whether they be attorneys or financial advisors. But do bear in mind that for the most part, it's easier to find advice about wealth than it is to find reliable advice about debt. Um, because there's no money in being a debt expert, right? So it really be careful when seeking that advice. And um, I encourage you to recognize that like it really is on you um, together with the help that that you can find um, to, to get this figured out and take these actions because there's nothing automatic uh, about it. Well, thank you so much, Heather. We're gonna have to uh, wrap it up there. I, and I apologize for running over on time. Thank you for that hugely informative presentation. And thank you for helping to make much of this possible with your advocacy efforts. Uh, so really a big thankful to you. I, I hope it was helpful to everyone who's watching. I really look forward to seeing the next presentation on November 15th. And for anyone who wants to see that, uh, you can get the details again by signing up at de.gov slash student loans. And we're going to cover some other additional student loan topics that will be very helpful to many of you. Um, if you want to watch this live stream again, I believe you can watch it again at the same link. I think you could probably just rewind it right now and rewatch it. But um, if that doesn't work, we'll send out another uh, link to a recording uh, as soon as possible. Um, and I apologize if we didn't get to answer your questions today. If you still have questions, you can try to email me at studentloans.delaware.gov. I can't necessarily directly answer your questions, but there's a good chance I can point you towards some information that you can read about your specific question that might answer your question. Um, and finally, let me say thank you one more time. Thank you to Heather Jarvis. Thank you to Treasurer Davis, DHR, Department of Human Resources, uh, Secretary DeMattis, Ashley Block, Wade and Daniel from GIC, Governor Carney, and anyone else I missed who has played any role whatsoever in making this happen. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to all of us for joining us today. Um, I hope to see you all again on November 15th. Uh, and that's, that's it. So have a great weekend, everyone. <laughs>